Good morning, friends, and welcome to Wake Up in the Word. We're in Matthew chapter 18 today. Grab you a good cup of coffee today. Got some great new iron brew on, on the stove, and we are ready to get started. In Matthew 18, I want to ask you questions. Jesus gets to a very important passage. Every, every, every one of these seems to be extremely important in the life of the church. Uh, today, what do you do when someone has fallen away, when they're getting away from the faith? You just say bye bye and let them go, or do you try to restore that person? Well, Jesus is going to answer that question for us today as we get to Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse number 15. Verse 15. Jesus says, You know, if your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. In private. That's a fantastic little prepositional phrase. In private. <laughs> Please use it. You know, have you noticed that people today no longer seem to care about that privacy? And I, maybe maybe it's just because we've given ourselves over to this world of social media and everything is public now. Why is that necessary? If you've got something against somebody, why do you go out and post it on Facebook or Instagram or wh whatever your social media is? You make a TikTok video about why you hate someone. Give me a break, friends. You got a problem with someone, you go to them first and foremost in private. If you don't know them well enough, uh, don't don't rebuke them at all. I mean, it's none of your business. So, you know, as we get to this passage, the first thing Jesus points out is that we should not be airing our dirty, other people's dirty laundry, especially in public and talking about other people. Gossiping has almost become a sport. I think you can letter in it in some schools and churches these days. Jesus says that's not the way it works. If your brother or your sister sins against you, go and rebuke that person in private. He goes on to say, now, if he listens to you, you've won your brother. So, hey, there's your chance to restore a relationship. If you think someone's sinning, they're doing something you're not supposed to, you don't broadcast it. You go talk to that person about it. It says, but if he won't listen, then take one or two others with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. Now, if you're reading as I am out of the Christian Standard Bible today, you'll notice that those uh, words are suddenly written in bold because he is literally quoting something from the Old Testament. Remember, Jesus said, I'm not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Well, if you remember back in Deuteronomy chapter 19, the directions for exactly how you're supposed to operate in a courtroom setting are laid out, uh, directions that we use even today. You can't convict someone on hearsay, for example, the he said, she said kind of stuff. There's got to be more evidence than just that, because a person who's out to get someone who's vengeful can make up stories. We've seen that happen publicly, even in the highest levels in our own country lately. Sometimes even a person makes up a story so that they can get more press. You can't just depend on that. You have to verify it. How do you do that? Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. One witness cannot establish any iniquity or sin against a person, whatever that person has done. A fact must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Wow. That should take care of an awful lot of situations, shouldn't it? So Jesus is leaning on this very same Old Testament principle and saying, look, if that person you're trying to restore a relationship with won't listen to you, then take along two or three people with you so that every fact may be established. And of course, that may be all it takes to restore that person to the walk that they need to be a part of to help them straighten out their life. But it says in verse 17, if he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. Now, some of you are already thinking, the church, church doesn't exist yet. The church won't exist till after Pentecost. What do you mean? Tell the church. I'll oh, see this may be one of these errors in scripture. See, you, you, you can't pay attention to this Bible stuff because look how it's all messed up. Surely this was added later. It's not accurate, is it? Oh, it's very accurate. Remember, this is the same word that Jesus used a couple of chapters before. Upon this confession, I will build my church. What was he talking about? This is the Greek word, ekklesia. Did an ekklesia already exist? Why, well, certainly it did. 
That word means the gathering, the congregation, the worshipers of God when they come together. Yes, that already existed. It existed from the time of Moses. So when Jesus is saying, tell the ecclesia, then he's talking about the group of folks that are already worshiping on a regular basis. They gather in the synagogues, they gather in the temple so that they can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And so here he's telling us again, and as the principle goes, if this person who's a member of your congregation is sinning, they're doing something that's wrong, and you've tried to restore them privately, and you've tried to restore them with witnesses, and yet they continue to go in this direction, then bring it before the entire gathering, or as we would call it in the New Testament sense, the church. So yes, the word is not only accurate, but it's powerful. Look at just how powerful. He says, if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, well, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. <laughs> so what's he saying? What did they do with the Gentiles and the tax collectors in the synagogues of the day? Well, they wouldn't have anything to do with them. They excluded them. They said, uh, hey, you know, you're out of here until you repent and make things right. And in those cases, it gave the person the opportunity to see there was something to lose if you don't maintain the proper relationship with God and with your brothers and sisters that are part of the body. And so with this opportunity, the person is always going to be welcomed back home if they're willing to repent and change their ways. Blows my mind today how we seem to throw that out of the window and just say, oh, folks can live any way they want to. We don't care. And we'll let them be a Sunday school teacher, deacon, leader, worship leader, whatever. And when we as a church don't maintain that kind of standard among the people who lead in our churches, then we begin to look just like the world. And the world can rightfully say, well, what's the difference? Why should I be a part of your group? You seem to have the same hangups as we do. That's right, because we are not obeying what Jesus told us to do when it comes to personal relationships and the relationships of people in our churches. So look at what he goes on to say. Now he's going to talk about the power of that church, of that body. In verse 18, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. Now, this is before the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, but Jesus is already saying, here is a principle that is true, even now. Even now, when two or three of you gather in my name, I'm there. God's right there in the middle. He's not outside waiting to be invited in. He's already in your presence. And this is the power of the gathering, the assembly, the ecclesia. This is why we gather. And if you are thinking, as I am thinking, that the last year and a half has been an unprecedented attack on the ecclesia, then you would be accurate. Entire governmental systems are saying, you don't need to do this. You don't need to gather. Oh, it might be dangerous for public health because, you know, you might pass along a virus. Yes, one that 99.5% of all people are going to recover from, but because you might pass that along, you can't gather. Now, you can go do a lot of other things. You can go shop at Walmart. You can go to the grocery store. You can gather. You can protest. You can burn down buildings, and you're okay. But no, 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 you can't worship because this is unnecessary. Friends, it's the most necessary thing that you have got to get into your life if you want the power of God in your life. Now, it doesn't have to be a big church. Jesus says, even where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. But you need to gather. The power of the assembly is present because of God's presence. And that presence is manifested when we decide that it is the most important thing for us to do in any given week to gather and to worship him. My friends, please quit making up excuses why you can't go to church. Well, I just kind of don't like where my church is going and it's not doing what I want it to do. I, listen, if you got problems with your church, find one that you can gather with and feel good about it and have in good conscience a group of people that you can worship with. If you don't, 
then you are missing what God can do in your life as well. Because he says, look, where two or three are gathered my name, I'm there among them. And look at what he says. When you make decisions as a body of Christ, which to do a particular ministry, take on a particular project, if two of you agree on earth about any matter that you pray for, not things that obviously would be against the revealed will, to, will of God, but those other things that are out there, stuff that we should be doing in these days, he says, then it will be done for you. You pray for it, and God is with you. The power of God, though, is only evident when we're willing to gather. So, friends, whether it's with two or three or two or three hundred or two or three thousand, friends, worship this week. Don't use, oh, well, it's summertime. I can vacation every weekend. Don't use that excuse. The power of God is not in the church today because we as a church are disobeying the very instructions of God when he said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Go to church. Get with the people of God. Pray. Do more than just kind of sit around and stare at each other. Pray about what God wants you to be doing in these days. And there you'll find the power to restore relationships, as Jesus was talking about, and the power to change society itself. So until he comes, let's keep meeting. Let's keep assembling. Let's keep the ecclesia together. God bless you. I'll see you again right here tomorrow as we wake up in the Word.